Gospel of St. John, chapter number 3, verse 14 through 17. There you will find my assignment for this morning. Standing to your feet, as is our custom, we will approach the Word of God respectfully, understanding that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Are you with me? <clears throat> Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Watch this. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have ever eternal life. I'm having a terrible time because I know the Bible in King James and I'm reading it in the NIV. And my, I keep going back and forth in my head. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He did not send his son into the world. We've misrepresented him. Because we act like God hates the world. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. My fascination is, for God so loved the world. Say that with me. For God so loved the world. This morning, I want to talk to you about bruised love. My subject is bruised love. Bruised love. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everything you whispered to me this week to feed the flock of God. And I believe you to bless it and to increase it and to strengthen me in such a way that I leave nothing out that you want said and include everything even if I didn't prepare it and you want to add it, I'm open to you to spontaneously combust on this stage to do what you would have me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. that's not a church song <laughs> and he knows that's not a church song but it is a starting point for what I want to talk to you about today Elvira is not in the Bible <laughs> as far as I know <laughs> but when I was about six years old <clears throat> uh, the street we lived on was a dirt road that had just gotten paved. My sister remembers everything I'm about to say. And at the top of the street, there was a family named the Dorcas. Reverend Dorcas had been the pastor of First Baptist Church of Vandalia. He wasn't currently at the time I was born, but before in the early ages he was. And he had a little girl up there <clears throat> daughter named Elvira. I hope she's not watching because I, I don't want her to know that I still remember her, but I do. 
uh, she was my first experience with love outside of my house. <laughs> she was fine. <laughs> no, this, I, ain't, I ain't gonna tell them, but she was like, She was light brown skin with long Indian-like hair running down her back. She was fine. She was cute. And I had this crush on her that was, I had a crush on her that was crazy. You remember that? I had such a crush on Elvira. <clears throat> I hate to tell you this. This long time ago, honey, this long before we got married. Long before we got married. Long before we got married, I just, long time ago, long time ago, long, long time ago, <laughs> maybe almost a century ago, I ain't sure it's been a long time, long time ago, but <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I took my mother's jewelry, I know, I know it was a dumb thing to do, but you know, I just want to confess, I took my mother's jewelry, and took it up there and gave it to Elvira. Cause my heart, <laughs> my heart was on fire, don't you see? For Elvira. And I was cool with it. Uh, till I found out that Elvira had dumped me for Wyatt Tolliver. These are real names. These are real people. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> I still remember everybody's name because I'm still kind of hot about them. You, but she dumped me for Wyatt Tolliver. I had an attitude. I ran up the street and they was all in the front yard playing because back when we grew up, nobody had air conditioning. You had to play outside. It was hot. It had no trouble getting your kids outside because it was hot. It was just which hot you wanted to pick, the hot inside or the hot outside. So they was outside playing. I took a brick and I threw it. And uh, I couldn't throw, so don't worry about it. This is not domestic violence. Do not arrest me, police officers in the building. This was not domestic I threw it at Elvira because she had hurt my heart. It only went about five or six feet, but I threw it in. I wanted her to know that I was militant. And take this tough land down. And I ran as fast as I could back down the hill, which made my brother, all he could see, my brother could see the back of my head. And my brother and my sister started calling me Humpty Head. <laughs> and I ran back home. Mama was at work. When mama got off work, Miss <laughs> Dorcas called Miss Jakes, and I was really concerned. <laughs> Hiding behind the door as my mother talked to Elvira's mama on the phone. And mama was laughing. She said, oh, that's so cute. And I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. She not mad. She was laughing until she hung up. She went from laughing to the exorcist. Her head turned completely around on her head, like on her neck, like something I have never seen. And she said, your heart may be on fire, but <laughs> when I get through with the worst whooping I ever got in all of my life, I want, I mean, one of them old school whoopings. One of them, I mean, oh, this is not a spanking. This is not time out. This is not go to your room. This is, I'm going to kill you and tell God you died. I got one of them kind of whoopings. I tell you what, I ain't stole nothing else. I'm 65 years old, and you can't pay me to steal nothing else. When mama got through with me, I got her jewelry back, 
and, and my heart was not on fire. But everything else had gone up in smoke. I mean, everything. She got everything. The bottom of my feet on up to the crown of my head. She anointed it. And, and that was my first experience with heartbreak. Uh, you know, the, 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 the funny thing about us, all of us have a story like that. It might not be that crazy, but you know, I was gonna be an exceptional person, so I had to start early. Uh, everybody has a moment where you had an experience, maybe it was puppy love like that, or maybe it was more serious love that did not end up the way you thought. And you paid a price for love that was painful. I heard somebody say, and I understood the context in which they meant it, they said that, that love doesn't hurt. Then they were, they were talking about domestic violence, and I agree. Uh, with him totally about that. But, but I don't like the statement out of context because love does hurt. Love hurts. It hurts to care. Love hurts so bad that, 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 that it's the funniest thing we have the oddest relationship with it. We, we all want it and we all need it. And yet we try to dodge it. Maybe it's because it's so expensive. Love is expensive, not just with checks and dinner and stuff. I'm not talking about cards and flowers and stuff. Love, love is expensive because love requires an openness that is unsettling. A, a transparency that is difficult. And so while we love to be loved, we love to be loved, but when it comes time for us to fall in love, we don't know where it's gonna go. And it starts out with your heart on fire, <laughs> but often it doesn't always end up like it starts. And I'm not just talking about romantic love. Uh, love for anything, anyone, uh, it could be a pet. And you can love the pet and then something happens to the pet and you're crushed. And you can be crushed so bad that you don't even want another pet for a while because you don't want to invest that much and, and lose it again. If, if, if you can cry over a pet, then before it, when you have the baby, the baby is crying. Before it's over, you gonna cry. Don't think that the tears are just for the child. Before you finish, little boo boo, <laughs> little hopscotch, <laughs> little humpty head. <laughs> will break your heart. And that's part of the process. And it determines how tough your love is, how you respond, tough being strong, to the challenging times of love, to the rejection of love, to the isolation of love, to the expense of love. All of that is, is, is difficult. And, and because we, we want to protect ourselves from the pain and the bruise that comes from the impact and the trauma and the pain, often we lock out the pain, not realizing that the same mechanism that locks out the pain locks out the pleasure. So while you have insulated yourself to the point that, that you can't feel the pain, you will eventually notice that you can't feel the pleasure either. Because a wall is a wall, and without discrimination, once you put it up, it locks everything out, and you go numb. 
And it is so difficult to get the courage to dismantle the wall because the wall protects you from the pain, but it imprisons you without the pleasure. Love is a complicated thing. It's a very difficult thing. A whole chapter Paul wrote about love alone. It endures all things, hopeth all things. He talks about the endurance of love. It seeketh not its own. He said, now abide of faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of the three is always love. The greatest of anything is always in the third dimension. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. The greatest is always in the third dimension, outer court, inner court, holies of holies. Body, soul, spirit. The greatest is always in the third dimension. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the greatest is always in the third dimension. And while you can get faith good and you can get hope good, the, sometimes we have trouble with the love. So you can be strong in faith and full of hope and locked up about love. That's why some of the most anointed, gifted, dancing all over the church people can also be rude in the parking lot. I knew you could appreciate that illustration. Because if they honking their horn at you and giving you sign language and you're not deaf, you wonder, was you the same person that had a word of knowledge in the church and you were singing that song in the choir and you hit that note and I got goose pimples and now you screaming at me in the parking lot? Johnny Cash's son wrote a book and I pulled a quote out of it for you to hear. I thought it was profound. He said, true love is many things. True love is many things. And can, sur and can survive the strongest and most painful of times. True love. I'm not talking about fake love, true love. When love comes out on the other side of a fire, it may be scarred forever. But this bruised love is somehow only greater for having survived the pain. The people that are clapping have survived the pain. We have this polarized relationship with love where we, we want it and yet we're afraid of it. We, 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 we draw it and get close to it and we entertain it, but don't stay over. You can have coffee and we can do brunch, but, but don't get lodged in my heart because love will bring a strong man to his knees. Love will make a tough guy cry in his pillow. Love will take a rough, resilient woman and bring her to her knees. Love will make you do things that you said. <laughs> you would never do. Love will make you take things that you thought you would never take. Love will make you ignore things that you thought you would never ignore be, be, because love has a way of surviving pain. It seems like an oxymoron that you would bring love and pain up in the same sentence because love is so romantic after all. It is so sincere. A mother holding a baby in her arms, nursing at her breast, taking its nourishment out of her body is as intimate as you could possibly be. You would never think that that child could grow up and cuss you out, <laughs> punch you, slap you in the face or steal your car and leave you in pain.
But if you live long enough, if you live long enough, or if you let them live long enough, <laughs> there will be moments where love goes on trial. There will be tough times that you, you, you will have to deal with love. The problem with heartbreak, with, 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 with a bruised love, is if I have a bruised arm, you can treat it. If, if I have a bruised shin, there's something you can do about it. But if my love is bruised, there is no surgery for a broken heart. Not the kind of heart I'm talking about. There is no surgery for a broken heart. There is no pain medicine for a broken heart. You don't, you, you don't believe me. If somebody breaks your heart, take Tylenol. See, see if it'll do you any good. The, the vulnerability of the heart is hinted at in the human body itself. The human body itself hints at the vulnerability of the heart because the heart is surrounded by a rib cage, the physical heart. It's surrounded by a rib cage to protect the physical heart because the physical heart is powerful, keeping you alive, pumping blood to the furthermost part of your body. Miles and miles of arteries and veins and circulatory systems are at the mercy of the power of the muscle of the heart to pump blood. And any place it doesn't reach, you're going to have a problem, even if it's your toe. And how could a heart be so powerful and yet so sensitive? Just a few weeks ago, football player playing on the field and, and impacted his chest, had two heart attacks before they could get him to the hospital be, because, because the heart is powerful but vulnerable. Surrounded by the rib case, the ribs are connected to the sternum with a strong, somewhat flexible material called cartilage. It's designed in such a way that the rib cage helps to protect the organs in the chest, such as the heart, the lungs, from damage. God knew to protect the physical heart. Even though the heart is strong, it is vulnerable. I want to dwell on that. Even though the heart is strong, it is vulnerable. If I am to become the heart of God, that means I must be as strong as I am vulnerable. If I lose either one of them, I cease to represent the heart of God. If I go for the strong and let go of the vulnerable, I don't reflect the heart of God. I mistake it up under the false identity of being a strong woman. I'm a strong man. Yeah, but you hard. And if you are hard, you are not like God because God gives us a hint in the physical heart that you must be strong enough to keep pumping and vulnerable enough that you have to be protected. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? In the spirit realm, now I went from, from, from the physical uh, to, to the, the, the physical to the emotional, and now I'm going to go to the spiritual. In the spirit realm, God warns us to guard your heart. For out of your heart flows the issues of life. And what he's talking about is guard your spirit. And he says, I don't have a rib cage around your spirit. So you've got to stand guard over your heart who you let in, who you let out, what you let flow out of your heart, because out of your heart flows the issues of life. That's where your creativity comes from. That's where your endurance comes from. That's where the power to fulfill your vision comes from. When you stop feeling, you stop being creative. When you stop feeling, you stop dreaming. When you stop feeling, you stop believing. When you stop feeling, you stop functioning. You become a machine. 
machine, a robot, a mannequin. You become an iPad. You become a laptop. You become just functional but not relational because you've lost your ability to invest emotion. And God said, guard your heart. Stand on it night and day. Night and day guarding your heart because out of your heart, not your head, not your intellect, not your degrees, not your vocabulary, out of your heart flows the issues of life. If you got more in your head than you have in your heart, you'll go bankrupt. You'll be a walking encyclopedia, but if you've lost your empathy, you'll lose all of connection with humanity because we don't care how much you know until we know how much you care. It has been said that grief is the price we pay for love. And what that simply means is people who don't love much don't grieve much. You have to be a lover to have great grief. And most people won't invest enough because they don't want to go through the tragedy of the loss of losing because great lovers are great grievers. I'm talking about capacity. Some people sitting beside you don't have the capacity to care enough, to work enough, to grieve enough, to feel enough to meet your need because if you if they have a pint size capacity and you have a gallon side capacity and, and you keep saying I need more and they keep saying I'm giving you all I got neither one of you are lying you're just unequally yoked because you have yoked yourself to somebody who doesn't have the capacity to give you what you need and I can't help how much you need it if I don't have it you can't get it so when you're dating, instead of asking them what kind of car you drive and where you work, you need to check out their capacity. Who's in your life that's been in your life a long time that you still love? What have you endured and came out loving on the other side? Who, who did you give up and why did you give them up and why did you cut them off? And how do you feel about it? Because some people can cut you off and think absolutely nothing about it because they don't have capacity. They were never invested in you in the first place. When John the writer writes here about God, he says that God so loved. It, it, it would be enough to say that God loved because God is love. But he says that God so loved. He had to put an adjective in front of it to modify the noun to make you understand the magnitude of the infinitive capacity of God to so love. The infinite capacity, Paul said, Peter said, I pray that you might know the love of God with passive all understanding. The breadth, the height, the depth of the love of God is, is, is incomparable. You can only try to come up with anthropomorphic terms to describe the infinite capacity for God to love. God said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I loved you when you were drunk. I loved I loved you when you were high. I loved you when you were nasty. I loved you when you were wicked. I loved you when you were evil. I loved you when you were fornicating. I loved you when you were stealing. I loved you when you were down and out. I loved you when you were in a homeless shelter. I loved you when you were in a jail cell. I loved you when you didn't have food to eat. I loved you when you was rich. I loved you when you were turning tricks. I loved you when you were strung out on cocaine. I loved you when you were on Christ. God so loved. Yeah. 
God so loved. God so loved. God so loved. God so loved. Can, I want you to drink that. That's hard for you to drink. But if you drink that, that will heal you. God so loved you. If you drink that, you won't need people as much as you need them. If you drink that, you won't be as lonely as you are. If you drink that, you won't be as desperate as you are. You don't need somebody to love you. God so loved and don't buy what the church people say it didn't say that God so loved the church it didn't say that God so loved the Christians it didn't say that God so loved the believers it said that God so loved and most of us who preach about him and teach about him can't express that because we're so self-righteous and judgmental that we want to pick who God loves. But you cannot build a wall high enough that God's love will not scale it. It will climb over top of it. It will put a ladder up and reach it. I don't care what you say. You might not like them. You might not like them. You might lock them out. You might lock them out. There are people that God loves your enemies. God loves the people that did you wrong. God loves the people that you want to get even with. I know you don't want to hear that because you want God to destroy them. But that person is God's child too. And God loves them. The crazy ones, the foolish ones, the spiteful ones, the vicious ones. God so loved the world. The world, the world, the world, the world. The world, God has fallen in love with the fool. God has fallen in love with the fool. God has fallen in love with the world who he says its heart is continually wicked and every imagination in it is evil and still. <laughs> I've fallen in love with the world that doesn't come home at night. I've fallen in love with the world that's drunken off of success. I've fallen in love with the world that's narcissistic. I've fallen in love with the world that doesn't communicate with me. I've fallen in love with the world that will not praise me. I've fallen in love with the world that's locked up in a strip club. I've fallen in love with the world that's practicing witchcraft. I've fallen in love with the world, not the church. God, so long. the world he so loved he so loved the world stop thinking that you earned it stop thinking that you earned it stop thinking that God loves you because you're smart stop thinking that God loves you because you're talented stop thinking that God loves you because you can sing stop thinking that God loves you before you because you can preach God told Jeremiah before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee I ordained thee and I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nation before you opened your mouth or cried your first cry or hit your first note or learned your first scripture I loved you I loved you, I loved you while you were learning your ABCs I loved you, while you were trying to stand up and learning how to hold your head up, I loved you while you were bobbing your head and your mama had to hold your neck I loved you while you were playing with pornography, I loved you while you were living in sin, I loved you while you were in the gutter, how could you get saved and then think that I don't love you, I loved you when you were blasted, I loved you when, oh God, don't, don't, don't See, we don't preach about love. We don't preach about the love of God. The love of God. And because we don't preach about it, it does not manifest in our character. Because anything that's not preached about is not planted in our character. So what we have is a situational love. I love you if I like you. I love you if I agree with you. I love you if you vote like me. I had a woman hit me up on Instagram the other day said, I used to love you. Hallelujah. I thought, oh God, then you never did in the first place. If something I, if something I said could kill you, love that quick it wasn't real love because love suffers long and is not puffed up how can you be broken hearted you don't even know me you never met me have you lost your mind I 
want you to see the inequity of this statement. Not that God so loved the righteous or the church. The inequity of the statement is that God so loved the fool. Have you ever fallen in love with somebody that was crazy? <laughs> and all of your family tried to tell you they was crazy. And even though you defended them deep down inside, you knew they were crazy. But some kind of way you fought for them and you told all people that you do love and that loved you to defend somebody that was crazy. I don't mean crazy, crazy. And God so loved the world that he told one prophet I want you to go out and marry a harlot and I want you to marry her and watch her turn tricks in the street and watch her have children by Johns and watch her begin her on a slave table buck naked and by her back just so you can understand how I feel loving you you're the slut I married you're the tramp I took home you're the hoe I put my ring on your finger and even though you keep turning tricks with idol gods I still redeemed you I bought you off the slave table and I just want somebody to understand how I feel loving you with your moody self, with your stubborn self, with your hateful self, with your judgmental self. I watch you judge other people for stuff that I know and you know that I know that you did too. And now you're sitting up trying to kill somebody else for their weakness while you enjoy your own. God so love. I loved you while you were in adultery. I loved you while you were in idolatry. I loved you while you were worshiping Baal. I loved you while you were worshiping the goddess of lust and fornication. I watched you bow at her altar. I watched you as you worship Ashtaroth. I watched you as you bow before the gods of the heathens. But I so loved you. I chastened you, but I loved you. I challenged you, but I love you. I corrected you, but I loved you. Do not think that my chastening means I don't love you because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And the reason I got after you is because I was in love with you. I knew you were a slut, but I loved you anyway. Can I go deeper? God, God has the prophet to marry a harlot so that the prophet can understand what God is going through loving humanity. What, is God, what God is going through loving you. What God is going through loving me. How can I be so arrogant when I consider the inequity of our relationship? that he who is perfect has married that which is flawed. That he who is infinite has fallen in love with that which is finite. That he that is above reproach has married something that is filthy. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Menstrual rags is what it literally means. He said that's what your righteousness looks like me. It's discarded rags from a cycle. That's what I think of your morality. Look at the inequity of the love. God so loved the world is a bodacious statement. It is the heartbeat of the gospel. If you don't understand this, then you've got legs and arms and feet and toes and eyes and head, but no heart. The heart of the gospel itself is in John 3.16. God so loved. The world. I put the rainbow in the sky because I love the world. 
after the flood was over and the water subsided, I made a promise and a covenant with Noah that I would never do that again. I'll never chasten you that hard again because I so loved the world. Let us go back and understand that Satan, Lucifer, I'll call him by his angelic name, Lucifer knew the love of God. So when he was cast down out of heaven, he wanted to get even with God because he knew that God loved man and hated sin. And as long as what God loved, which is man, was separate from what, that which God hated, which is sin, God had no problem in his own emotions. But if he could get man to sin, then man would be filled with what God hated and put God in a dilemma that if he reacted to what he hated, he would kill what he loved. If he reacted to what he loved, then he would have to love what he hated. That's why salvation is not about you. Salvation is about God. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not about you. It's not about your doings. It was God's dilemma and it was Satan's trick to work God love against him. He said, I'll put what you hate in what you love and say how you like them now. And God had warned man the day you eat of the tree you shall surely die. And so now God is in a dilemma. Do I come into the garden and kill him? But I love him. So the doctrine of substitution is born in the dilemma that Satan has placed God in. That God paces the floor, the voice of the Lord walking through the cool of the garden. God paces the floor trying to figure out how to save what he loves and kill what he hates. And he says, hey, Adam, where art thou? And Adam is standing, wrapped up in fig leaves, hiding in trees. And God is pacing the floor. And God goes back and forth and says, stay right there. You can't fix this. This is above your pay grade. You can't get yourself out of this. You can't sow nothing on yourself that will cover you well enough to make you righteous enough. And if I let you live, I will have lied. And I'm not a man that I should lie or the son of man that I should repent so if I let you live I can't wink at your sin because if I wink at your sin then Lucifer will have tricked me into lying so I got to do something about it but I don't want to kill you because I love you stay right there and the Bible said that God went out into the garden and found an innocent lamb and he took the lamb and took the sins of the man and put placed it on an innocent animal and he slayed the lamb and the lamb became a substitute for the man so that the man might be free so God could go back to Lucifer and say I did kill Adam in the animal and then I took the life of the animal and covered the wretchedness of Adam so that Adam stood there with blood running down his legs from the just from the fresh kill body of the animal and the life that he now lived in the flesh he lived by the faith of the animal that died in his stead that he might live justice is satisfied mercy is victorious God has been glorified and his word has not been broken God so loved the world But the coats of skin were only placebos, pacifying the problem, making it possible for God to be able to extend time before he released his ultimate plan. It pacified the problem because according to Hebrews 10, 3 through 10, jot that down, Hebrews 10, 3 through 10, I want you to take a look at this. Can I go deeper? 
But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, talking about Jesus, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Jesus, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sins thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Are you feeling me? By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. <laughs> once. For some, once for a few, once for black folks, once for brown folks, once for white folks. You don't have to like me, but you can't stop the blood from getting to me. If God wants to reach me with his blood, your walls are not God's walls. God's blood will reach me. I might be in jail, but God's blood will reach me. I might be guilty, but by the way, you're guilty too. And if the blood got you, it'll get me too. I'm talking about God's love. Oh my God, 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 oh my God. The price he paid to love you. When, when, we, when, we, when we read about the cross in the book of Acts, the Bible says after his passion, he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. And when I look at Calvary, I see pain. I see execution. I see cruelty. I see injustice. I see death. I see abuse. But when he looks at Calvary, he called it passion. I never will forget the passion of the Christ. Anybody see that movie? I saw it one time. I bought a copy, but I never played it again. It was not a scene I wanted to see again. It was not a movie I could enjoy. It was not a movie where you ate popcorn and sat up and watched it. It was not entertaining watching somebody beat to death till their skin was hanging out. It was not my idea of a pleasurable evening. It is not my idea of a passionate evening. But God calls it passion because he was giving his body to his bride. But a body hast thou prepared for me. Now I can give her my body. And all of a sudden I have to challenge how I define love how I understand passion. Because when I think of passion, I think of pleasure. When God thinks of passion, he thinks of pain. When I think of love, I think of a wonderful feeling. When God thinks of love, he thinks of bruises. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. <laughs> we are healed. We are healed, not just healed, we're made whole. Like the 10 lepers, nine of them got healed, but one of them was made whole. In order to go from healed to whole, you got to come back. Tell y'all, y'all come to church one time, come to the altar call and go on about your business. You think you got something. You didn't get nothing. You got healed, but you're not whole. You get whole when you keep coming back. When you keep coming back to say thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for how you changed my life. Thank you for how you picked me up. Thank you for how you looked over my sin. Thank you for how you made a way of escape. Thank you for how you loved the unlovable. Touch the untouchable. Reconcile the unreconcilable. Redeem the unredeemable. I owe you the praise. You good little two-shoe people who never did anything, I understand why you don't praise the Lord because you think you're righteous. But I cannot understand all of you dirty, low-down, filthy people that know you was a wretch undone, how you can sit there with your cute dress on and not praise God for his mercy towards you because God took bruises. He took bruises for you. And every animal that was ever slain was just a stand-in for him. When we do movies and the actors are, they're setting up the set and they're getting ready for the scene and the director's trying to get the shot right, he has uh, substitute actors that come in and fill in for the real actors so that the actors won't spin themselves. Every bullock and goat that was slain until Jesus went to the cross was a substitute actor standing in for the legitimate one who would go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. They were filling in for bruised love by the way you can't have bruises without blood a bruise is made out of blood so the 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 the, the impact the bond the pain the, the the point of impact is over but the bruise remains he took my bruises. He took my bruises so much so that even after he rose from the dead, he still bore the scars in his body. The scars were still there for the price he paid for you to have a chance. While you complain about parking places and you complain about coming out in the cold and you complain about driving too far, he carried his cross up Golgotha's hill and let them inflict him with bruises that even the resurrection couldn't take away. He rose from the dead and still didn't rise from the bruises. And you're sitting up here talking about, when will somebody ever love me? I'm just wondering how long will I have to go through this before I find somebody who loves me like I need to be loved. I'm just not being loved like I needed to be loved and I, I refuse to settle for anything less. If God refused to settle for anything less, you would go to hell. I'm going to say it again for the people in the back. If God refused to settle for anything less, you would go to hell. So you have more right to be loved than God? God so loved the world. The problem with us is we think more highly of ourselves than we ought because we have romanticized love. That's why you're 30 and been married three times. 
We have romanticized relationships that the moment it gets uncomfortable, we get out. And the moment we don't like what you say, and the moment you don't, you lost your job, I'm through with you. Yeah, it's about the Benjamins, baby. No, it's not about the Benjamins. With a job, without a job, up or down, sick or well, dialysis, kidney machines, oxygen tank, I don't care what it is. There is a love. There is a love that endureth all things. It may get bruised, but it will never back away. It is the love of God. The only way we can do it, and I'm going to stop here because I see I can't get through my message. The only way we can do it is that the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The only way you can love like God is to be filled with God. And when you get filled with God, you can love like God. Until you get filled with God, you can't love like God. You can't do it out of your emotions. You can't do it out of your head. You can't do it because I preached it. You got to be filled with God to love like God. You can, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost and if you really got the Holy Ghost the real sign of the Holy Ghost is not speaking in tongues the real sign of the Holy Ghost is when you love your neighbor the real sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost is when you love people who mistreated you the real sign of the Holy Ghost is when you love people after they have done you wrong the real sign of the Holy Ghost I'm not talking about letting people make a fool out of you you may have to love them at a distance but you still love them the real sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost is that you love them with an everlasting love and I'm sick and tired of people preaching about something that they don't have, teaching about something that they don't have, worshiping with something that they don't have, how can you be a worship leader and can't be speaking to the people you worshiping with and yet you want to bring glory down in the house, the devil is a lie, until the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, there will always be something missing out of your message, out of your song, out of your business, out of your life. There is something that God is about to do in your life that means you're, you're going to have to have a makeover. You're going to have to have a makeover. You're going to have to get rid of your old filthy garments and your own hateful opinions and your stiff-necked attitudes. And you're going to have to humble yourself at the cross and first receive the love of God into your heart and into your spirit and then emanate the love of God into the way you treat people and handle people. This is how we know. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples that ye have love one toward another you'll never be my disciple because you wear long dresses you'll never be my disciple because you don't wear makeup you'll never be my disciple because you shout all over the church well, you are my disciple when the love of God affects how you treat the people around you you are my disciple when you learn how to forgive you are my disciple when you can't hold a grudge you are my disciple when you love people for which you have nothing to gain. You are my disciple when you don't get nothing back out of it and you still do it anyway. You are my disciple when you love people who are downtrodden. You are my disciple when you love people who stink. You are my disciple when you love people who can't live like you live or go where you go or eat what you eat and you still love. You are my disciple when you love the homeless. You are my disciple when you love people with mental problems. You are my disciple when you love people who are handicapped. You are my disciple when you love people who are fornicators and whoremongers and perverts. You are my disciple when you love people who do things you don't like. You are my disciple when you can feed somebody and can't stand the smell, but you feed them anyway. You are my disciple when you serve. You are my disciple when you carry the bruises. of love so as I close this morning stand to your feet as I close this morning 
I wonder if there's anybody in here. I'm going to pick. Can I pick this up next Sunday? Yeah. I want to pick this up next Sunday because I didn't even get to the text. <laughs> I just got through the introduction. <laughs> and I looked at the clock and thought, oh, my God. I haven't even skimmed the surface of what I came to say. But if it, God let me live, I'll finish this message next Sunday. You are my disciple. And what this ought to do, if you're honest and if you're true, is make you know, I need a makeover. 